Because I think the challenge, right, with communicating about ADHD is that it is not a one size fits all. Everyone looks different inside. Everyone's struggles are very different. It is very, very challenging to describe what it is. And that creates a lot of isolation and loneliness. And that's where a lot of the feelings of the self-esteem issues and people feeling less than because they can't communicate what their challenge is and it's not understood by anyone. What's up, ADHD Rewired listeners? Hey, before we dive into today's show, if you have been thinking about joining our coaching and accountability groups, we start in like two weeks. So head on over now to coachingrewired.com to get your name added to our fall interest list. And in case you missed our big announcement, we rolled back our pricing to pre-2020 levels. So don't wait. Go now to coachingrewired.com to get started with your pre-registration process so you can join us for our next registration event tomorrow, September 27th at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. And if you just happen to miss that, go to the website to see when our next one is. Plus, after your 10 weeks of coaching, we're also including six months of membership in our alumni community for continued support because maintenance can be tough and it's a lot easier when you don't have to struggle alone. That's coachingrewired.com. Go there now. You won't regret it. More at the break. Now, on with the show. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. Today's guest is Jessica Ovidi. I didn't even say that right, did I? O- o- you did, Ovidia. I mean, Ovi- you didn't finish Ovi- it, but you... Ovi- yeah. You know why I didn't finish it? It's because I wrote it phonetically, but didn't add the E-A part. I wrote <laughs> o- O-H-V-A-H-D-E-E, and then I just stopped writing. So I wrote exa- I said exactly what I had uh, written. You did. No, honestly, I used to be Klein, which is... Pretty easy. So I'm still not used to it and I've been married for 15 years. So, you know, you're doing great. You're doing great. So we have (laughs) Jessica Ovadia. And Jessica is a healthcare communicator and a problem solver with a decade of experience helping clients articulate their message through engaged interactions, artful language choice, and thoughtful strategy. Jessica has a Bachelor's of Science in Communication from New York University and a Master's of Public Health from Emory University. Her love of healthcare and deep passion for effective, clear communication naturally led to the foundation of her consulting firm, Jessica Oladio Healthcare Messaging. Jessica, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. It's kind of funny as I was reading the, the bio talking about clear, effective communication as I was stumbling over your name there. <laughs> <laughs> it happens to the best of us. My goodness. <laughs> All right. So... Let me ask you this. So you have, uh, your, your your kids have ADHD, is that, is that correct? Two of them? Yeah, two out of four. Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then you learned that you had ADHD. Yeah. I mean, I, I knew I had it earlier in my, uh, maybe even in high school, but hadn't really gotten a formal diagnosis. Medicated for a year or two and then sort of stopped. And then as I had these kids and started look, looking at their challenges and going down the road of trying to help them. Coincidentally, my challenges started coming up to the surface as well. And so we've sort of been on a, a journey together, you might say. The three of us, the three out of six of us in the family. Okay. And how did that show up for you? And, and was the symptoms of your ADHD, did, that, did it become worse as you were having uh, growing a family? Yeah, I just kind of felt like the demands on my life became more than I could handle. Mm. I always really prided myself on someone who, yes, had some challenges like all of us do. But with lists and processes, I was sort of okay. I got by. I always had to work harder than my friends in high school, but, you know, always got that B plus. So it was never something that was glaring me in the face as a problem. I always just worked hard and it kind of figured itself out. And I was getting to a point in my life where there were just so many demands, um, professional, personal. And I just, I felt that I could have an easier life. I I felt it. Um, And as I was trying to help my kids with some of those similar issues, challenges, obviously in a very different way, I started asking myself those same questions. Okay, what can I do here that I'm not thinking of or that I haven't done in the past that can help me and make it better, easier? So that's kind of where where it was at that time. So did you at some point then in in the last, I don't know, recent years, sort of re-realize that you had ADHD and then start to to kind of take that that Uh, more of an active management approach? Absolutely. I would say growing up, I actually thought that I was someone that had anxiety. I knew again, I knew, okay, I have some trouble focusing. 
but I always thought that anxiety was the thing that was, was pushing me. And um, again, in taking my kids through their evaluation and physicians and medication, et cetera, started talking to some physicians for myself and really uncovering that so much of my unmanaged ADHD was, that was where the anxiety was coming from. And so I started to kind of think differently about how I was as an adult and how, how I got there and try to sort of unlearn those patterns that I sort of developed and yeah, kind of get reacquainted with some of those challenges that I had defined for myself that may or may not have been, you know, there for that reason. And so when I started looking at ADHD for what it was for me and was open again to medication and was open to sort of thinking through my challenges in a new light, I, I definitely got, uh, yeah, I got to reacquaintance myself, if that's a word. I, I became reacquainted, <laughs> whatever the word may be, as a communication person. Um, I got connected with that part of me again um, in a new way. And it's been it's been a really interesting journey for me. And are you currently medicated? I am. You mm -hmm. are? Okay. Yeah. So, all right, let me ask you a little bit about so what you do professionally and sort of how this all sort of connects to ADHD. Because mm -hmm. I know, you know, so you own a business. And mm -hmm. owning a business, it in some ways, it can be more forgiving of when the ADHD kind of shows up, but it also has a way of really highlighting all the ways mm -hmm. the ADHD Absolutely. shows up. Yeah. So what sort of led you to one, like starting your own business versus working for someone else? And what, what's your passion sort of stem from with, with uh, clear communication around healthcare? Mm-hmm. So I'll, I'll answer the second question first as part of my journey, trying to think about like, okay, so who I, who am I as an adult and how did I get to this point and what steps can I take to sort of make things a little better for myself or easier? Um, I kind of got to this realization that personally with anything that I do, when I initially kind of encounter it, it's pretty complex in my head. There's a lot of chaos in my head mm -hmm. and I have to go through several steps internally to sort of simplify that. I have to figure out, you know, what's going on here? What's the goal of this? Whether it's a list or a process or a system, I usually mentally go to like the worst case scenario and map, map it out. So I've got all the plans and then I immediately calm down and I sort of simplify it in my head. And I realized that so much of the expertise that I give over in my professional life is that same process. In healthcare, now I have an interest in healthcare. I grew up with physicians as parents. Um, so I've always been very interested in it, got my master's in it. I love the knowledge seeking piece of healthcare, but the piece about the communication, I mean, healthcare is so complex in so many different ways. And I have gotten so good personally at simplifying complexities that I've taken that over into my professional life. And so I love helping healthcare clients, you know, companies, startups, simplify the complexities of what they're trying to do. And I realize that I'm using very similar processes for them professionally as I do for myself personally. And so it's been kind of a seamless transition as I think about what do I want to do professionally and how do I want to grow? Well, I want to help companies, founders simplify the complexities of their message so that they can really speak clearly and consistently to the right people. So that professionally is just an interesting kind of uh, insight that I gained over the last couple of years that I'm really doing what I do personally, just in a different mindset. With growing my business, absolutely. It's been such a clear, wow, this is perfect for me. As someone with ADHD, as someone who does get, quite frankly, bored in a, a one job, right? So I am giving each client very similar services, but I'm getting to kind of excitingly have that dive deep beginning phase where I'm learning and I'm growing with them and exploring with them. And I have such a thirst for that piece of it. And that's been really exciting as a consultant. My biggest challenge and what I found to be most most challenging with ADHD and me personally is if something in my personal life is going on where I just I don't have the capacity to recruit motivation, right? So if I'm feeling burnt out or whatever it is, um, whether it's because I have ADHD or not, it's nearly impossible for me to recruit that motivation. And I can get pretty down on myself and a little bit hard. It's not so easy for me to take a step back and say, wait a second. Again, whether this is my ADHD or not, I'm a human and this is hard for me. And it doesn't mean that I'm a bad person or stupid. It just means this is hard. And so I think that because the system that I create for myself is purely my system and I don't have anyone else over my head, the downside of that is that if I'm feeling down, it's, it's only on me to get myself yeah. up again. And that's been hard. So let me ask you about uh, sort of motivation and burnout. 
So you know, I've, I've been at this for, uh, you know, the ADHD Rewired piece for about 10 years. And, you know, just in the last, um, I don't know, um, I'm recording this in, in July of uh, 2023. Um, and I've been sort of trying to manage some burnout. You know, and it's it's always interesting to me. It's like, cause I, I love what I do. And yet I'm also finding that like the stuff that I would normally have that sort of fire underneath me. I'm like, eh, eh, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how totally. do you, how have you been managing burnout? Yeah. So I've been trying to look at the things in my life that I love to do as hobbies that I just haven't made time for. On on a personal note, we actually just we bought an apartment and we did a major renovation, which I think I was a fool to assume that it wouldn't have been as stressful as stressful as it was. I thought it was going to be stressful. I thought we were like totally prepared. And my goodness, it was like a total, you know, you know what show it was. It was tough. It was really tough. And I'm still recovering mm. because for me, because my internal mind is a bit chaotic, my external space really needs to be orderly and in construction and moving that there is no such thing. So that has been incredibly difficult for me. And that has affected my business because I can't focus like I used to. All that said, I've thought a lot about, okay, what are the things that I like to do that just bring me joy? I really like to draw. I haven't done that a lot. I love to go for walks outside when the weather's beautiful. Things like that, I am really, really trying to be diligent about and adding back into my life in a way that's far beyond, yes, I'll go for a run for 20 minutes or the things that aren't like uh, routinized, you know? And that together with just being more patient with myself and recognizing that like it's totally human to not have this burning fire under your butt all the time about all the things you're doing. Like that is not a human, it's not human to do that all the time, you know? So that is working, but I have to be honest, it's, it's slower than I thought. It's a slower progression back to where I was. And that's, that's annoying. That's hard because I am. Yeah. I don't know. I I, I very, I very much relate uh, to that, you know, in between our, our coaching seasons, we usually have like three to four weeks and I usually will work a a lighter load like during that time, sort of intentionally. And I, I, this, this past sort of, uh, in between period, um, I worked even lighter than I would normally. Mm -hmm. And I would had been feeling some of that that um that burnout sort of lift a bit but i feel like i'm not like all the way there yet so like yeah. I, I made the decision that like from during the summer like fridays i'm not going to be working mm-hmm. uh this week i'm actually going camping i'm leaving leaving like midday thursday so i can have a three-day weekend because i find like being that i love the work that i do it's so important to me i know that i have a lot of people who are also depending on me not just you know in my community but also my team and if I'm not feeling the the oomph to like, you know, be the leader that I'm trying to be and that people need, that becomes like priority number one then is like mm-hmm. doing that sort of burnout um, self-care. And it's, and, and as you said, it's not just, uh, you know, going for, for 20 minutes of exercise, although exercise is super important to burnout. I think that part of that burnout cycle is maybe we, we become, we're like almost delayed on recognizing that we like were approaching burnout and then so yes. it, so it takes kind of that extra some extra effort some extra time to really recover from that so we can get back to really showing up as our our most full authentic self. Totally, totally. I was uh, reading something or listening to podcasts. I can't remember. And you know, someone was talking about with ADHD. You know, again, everybody gets burnout. These are not issues unique to us. However, um, it gets to a point that when we're feeling so burnt out, it does. It takes so much more effort. For those of us with these struggles to kind of get back to baseline and that's why some of these routine things you can build into your schedule that protect your creativity etc are so critical but it's easier said than done of course and you don't we often don't look in the mirror and say oh we have a problem yeah until we have a problem and we're like we don't want to go to work today what do we do so it's 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 always a challenge um and then again when you're your own boss it's only up to you so it becomes even more challenging to stick with that schedule so how do you manage that then? If if uh, you know you, you do benefit from some of that sort of external, like outside accountability, um, when you are your own boss? Yeah, it's really hard. Um, so I am a pretty regimented person because again, if I don't have regiment, then I kind of feel like my mind goes all over the place. So wherever I can create structure, I do. From the simple things like I get up and I make my bed. I never take off an item of clothing at night without putting it where it belongs. I mean, everything has a place and a process. It's very critical for me 
And then, you know, the truth is because I do have children, that does have a natural structure to my day, right? I'm not going to be so productive once they're home. It's just not going to happen. And so, you know, the work time tends to fit in there. My husband and I both value exercise. So we both really support each other and taking turns. And we often will at the beginning of the week or certainly the night before say, okay, when are you going to exercise tomorrow? When am I going to exercise tomorrow? And we pull up our calendar and we really, we mark it in. Mm. So, you know, there are like micro and macro ways that I build a structure where there is none into my life. Even looking into the summer, I mean, I can work from anywhere at any time. My kids are in camp some days, not in camp other days. And I create structure when there is none because Yes, I'd like to say it's great for the kids, but it's great for me. Um, so, so that's you know that I I really I lean in heavily to that, um, and you know, and it helps me, and it, it has definitely served me. The part that I'm not great at, that I'm really working on, is in times when I'm feeling like yes, I have a structure, but I just I'm looking at the computer screen right now, and all I see is blurry lines. I cannot read or process. I think the previous me would look at that and then start crying. Mm. And the current me says, okay, this isn't a good moment. And I kind of close the computer and I'll go for a walk or I'll take a shower. I still don't feel great about myself in those moments, if I'm being honest, but I'm recognizing that pushing through will just make it worse. Was there anything that you could identify that helped you start making that shift? Um, as I became a mother and watched my kids struggle and wanted to, you know, very much improve their struggles as well as our family life because of their struggles, um, I immediately kind of dived into, okay, like, what can I do here to help, right? So I'm a bit, I read the books. Um, we've gone to like parenting therapy to try and help us because nobody knows how to be a parent. You know, you're just given a kid and you got to kind of figure it out. So I've always been very into like, okay, there, there are things that we can do to change a situation. And so I take that same approach with myself. Anytime I'm having a struggle or I'm feeling ill feelings toward a friend or someone else, I'm like, you know what? Uh, I could change the way I feel. I don't need to change the external circumstances. And so I've always been very good, thank God, at kind of looking at myself and figuring out ways that I could change my perspective. And so I use that sa those same techniques here, right? So if I am, I, I could decide that I'm just going to continue to be sad and upset and frustrated, or I could work on recognizing I have a challenge. This is who I am. What am I going to do about it? One thing I have done very uh, obviously over the last couple of years is very openly talk about my struggles because I feel like the more I talk about it, even though it's probably really annoying for my friends and my spouse and everyone else, the more I talk about it, the more comfortable I feel about it, the more I'm not hiding anything. And it just, it really, really helps me be real with myself, which is the most important thing. Mm, I, I, I can't, can't, uh, disagree with that at all. I mean, it's, that is, um, being able to share openly kind of, you know, what's how it is to be us like is I find so helpful. And because if we are putting in so much effort and you know, mental effort to masquerade, like mm -hmm. we're taking that, like all the effort it takes to, to mask. And that's coming from, you know, we're, we're borrowing from other spaces in our life. That are really more Correct. important to be uh that then we need that sort of brain functioning for so um what i want to do really quickly jessica is to get you a quick break and uh, and when we come back i want to um ask you some questions around sort of the idea of overcomplication. because i think you mentioned something about that a little bit earlier and connecting that to what you are doing professionally because uh i know for most things in life if it can be overcomplicated, i can overcomplicate it mm-hmm and I know a lot of our listeners can too. So we will get to that after the break. Support for ADHD Rewired comes from our award-winning intensive online coaching and accountability groups at coachingrewired.com. Our fall season of coaching groups starts in just over two weeks. So if you thought you missed your chance to take advantage of our pre-2020 pricing plus six months of membership after our 10-week coaching program is over, then we have good news. There's still time. Join us for our next registration event tomorrow, September 27th at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. Head on over now to coachingrewired.com to add your name to our fall interest list so we can send you a special invitation to start your pre-registration process. Do you have every intention of starting that next house project, writing your resume, launching your business, or incorporating a new habit only to lose traction and run out of steam sometimes before you even start? Have you tried all the tricks and hacks and tips and strategy after strategy after strategy only to be left feeling overwhelmed and unsure of what to do next? 
If you're sick and tired of trying harder, why not work smarter, ready to try something different, and you can fully commit to six to seven hours a week for our 10-week intensive coaching program to work with other adults with ADHD who truly understand the challenges we face, then this is the group that you have been looking for. Go to coachingrewired.com to add your name to our fall interest list so we can send you a special invitation to start your pre-registration process. That way, you can join us for our next registration event tomorrow on Wednesday, September 27th at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 Eastern. And if you missed that session, go right now to the website to see when the next time you can register is, because who knows? Based on when you're listening to this, it could be tomorrow. And as a bonus, when you join our fall coaching sessions coming up in just two weeks, you'll also get access to our annual five-week series on yearly planning that starts at the end of November. But this group is life-changing in ways that sometimes even hard for me to express, but we're going to let some of our alumni share with you what it was like for them to go through this coaching group. Before this group, I doubted my ability to grow. I came to the group feeling uh, stuck. What I've accomplished in 10 weeks, I didn't do it alone. I did it with all of you. I did it with my A-team. It's one of the hardest things I've ever done. The results so far for me have been really positive. Uh, you realize that like trying to find better tools isn't really just the only solution. It's finding a community, finding people, and finding support, and learning how to ask for help, and learning how to give help better. I think that really helps make a difference. The thing that I learned was I have a place in this world. They just taught me to be compassionate with myself and to say, hey, you know, this is a process. This is the starter toolkit along with the boot camp. Everyone in the group who's talked about their issue, we all then become invested in wanting to see them grow and by proxy wanting to see ourselves grow. I can continue to learn and relearn the techniques that have been shared with me here and continue to receive the support that I've gotten here, which I also didn't know I needed, but I'm so grateful for. I came in expecting to get like a tool belt and then I take those tools and get with me, but I feel like more of a different person who has tools that I can use. So thank you, all of you, for such a wonderful experience. It's just been such a joy. This community is amazing, and I feel like I've found purpose. If you're thinking of joining this group, I would say absolutely do it. 100% you will not regret it. You'll gain such a greater understanding of yourself, and you will find a community just jumping out of their virtual chairs to support you. You get out of this program what you put into it. Be ready to be open, honest, and vulnerable with both yourself and your group. You are only cheating yourself if you don't, and there is a huge potential for growth if you do. I really appreciate everyone. Thanks, everyone. Don't wait any longer. Do this for yourself. Go to coachingrewired.com, get your name added to the interest list, and we will see you at our next registration event. That's coachingrewired.com. Finish off the year with a bang and get ready to make 2024 your best year yet because we're going to help you get your year planned and get you started on the right track. It all starts at coachingrewired.com. All right, we are back with Jessica Ovidia. All right, let's talk about overcomplication. So I think- My favorite topic. (laughs) Yes, so so many of us have this tendency to overcomplicate things. And one of the things for myself, I've learned to do is, you know, it's more that those reflective, those self-reflective questions. If I ask Mm -hmm. myself, am I overcomplicating this? Like 99% of the time, yes. Like if if that question just emerges organically for me, I'm overcomplicating it. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes, not even just for my, you know, manage my own life, but how we communicate to others. Like we overthink things and think, you know, and and it it can be kind of crazy making, right? Mm -hmm. How do you help people and yourself sort of recognize when we're overcomplicating things and how do we simplify things? Yeah, I think, you know, the first thing I do personally and counsel professionally is to think about who is your audience, right? So in our own minds, it's us. Okay, fine. But um, it could be your kids, your spouse. Um, With my clients, it's often the consumer, the end user, the patient, the provider, physician, whoever it is. 
who is that user or that audience and what are their pain points or what's their, what, what are they thinking about at that time? Communication is only successful communication when what you have said or what you've sent is received by the other person. So speaking is not communication. That's just one part of it, right? Just hearing or listening is also not communication. So in order to have successful communication, you have to really understand who you are talking to and what are their pain points? What are the things that they're thinking about? You know, personally, it might not be a pain point, right? You might just be having a conversation with a friend, but what are they thinking about that day? What's going on in their life? Approaching every conversation with that in mind first will always get you to that goal first. It will build that connection. And once you have that, you know, that really strong connection, um, organic communication, organic dialogue flows so much more simply. Um, and that, of course, brings you to the next point, right? The, the way that we communicate, the language we use, the method we use, simple words, simple dialogue, uh, that's always the best approach. So let me ask you this. So, you know, for me, one of the ways that, that my ADHD shows up is that sometimes I feel like I'm really good at, at communicating with my team, um, you know, whether it's on, on Slack or, and sometimes like I, I'll read someone posting something on, on Slack that they have some questions about something and my brain just goes, yeah, my brain just doesn't know how to respond to this right mm -hmm. now. So are there yeah. any like things you can maybe suggest uh, in a kind of more of a somewhat generalized way um, that can help people like, like me and you who other people are sort of counting on clear communication from us when our brain it doesn't always cooperate with us and give us that ability to clearly communicate. A hundred percent. So personally, I struggle with this a lot, actually, because I get texts and WhatsApps and I, I hate texting. I find it to be the most challenging task ever. Mm. Uh, way more than childbirth. It's so oh my difficult. God. <laughs> like, <laughs> I can't. I mean, I have to say to you, like, not to joke around, oh, my medication, but honestly, the first 30 minutes after I take my medication, I'm able to text like everyone in the history of the world. And right after that, like, I can't, I'm sorry, like you're going to wait for tomorrow. I just can't. So I totally, totally appreciate what you're saying. Um, what I have worked on and what I tell clients to is, you know, it's not just ADHD or texting, right? There are a billion ways to communicate out there and it becomes very overwhelming. So primarily you want to focus on what is the one or two primary ways that we communicate either internally or with your clients or wh whatever it is and focus on making a process and a system for that, that you don't move away from everything else. Okay. You, you know, you, you want to talk about internally, if you have a fully remote team and you need to think about, okay, yes, we have to have a Slack or a WhatsApp or tech. We have to have another way. Okay. Let's, let's make processes and, and systems for that. But for my team, we like to do a once a week phone call where we have a whole agenda that we're updating shared all week. And then we also have biweekly emails where we're sort of updating each other. That's a system that works really well for me and for my team. And so it works. Occasionally offhand, there might be a phone call or a texting or whatever, but it's known that if I haven't responded on that text, well, we're going to catch it on the weekly call or the email. So again, I think picking the one or two ways of communication that you really strictly build a process and a system and, you know, being, being kind to yourself about the other systems and being okay with what, you know, we were talking about before talking openly about it, saying, Hey, text is not good for me. You know, personally with my friends, they know if they send me a text and I don't respond, call me, I will always pick up the phone. I love talking on the phone and I love having coffee with friends. I love interacting. I hate texting. Mm. So I think that it's about picking your beast and going in with that and forgiving yourself for all the rest. <laughs> I know for the, the texting piece, I, by default, I'll have my, my writer receipts just on so people know that at, at least they know that I saw the text, right? Mm -hmm. um, That's actually interesting because I have a friend who said, I don't like when a friend reads it, but it doesn't respond. And I was like, oh man, so now like, what? you know, because they feel like, well, if you read it, then why didn't you respond? And I was trying to explain to them that someone with ADHD it's not that I don't want to respond. No, sorry. It's not that I can't respond or that I don't like you. It's that the act of responding feels really laborious. And she, you know, she couldn't relate. So I tried be, to break it down for her. <laughs> and then, you know, the, the, that whole thing where we spend, you know, five or 10 minutes trying to craft this perfect text response and, yes. and it's not really coming together. So then we just like give it like a thumbs up emoji. At, like after deleting everything <laughs> yeah, we wrote. Exactly. You know, and that's, I, I do find that's one of the, the challenging things is that it's the, sort of that intermittentness of our brain cooperating with us on how we are expressing ourselves, uh, especially in writing. Um, for, and that's how, one of my bigger challenges. Okay, mm. so 
how do you help people who have a message focus on keeping it simple? Mm. So it does go back to the audience. So first and foremost, who are you talking to and what do they feel? Then you think about your message. What do you want to say to them? The reason I always suggest thinking about the person that you're speaking to first is that your message can, if you lead with just what you want to say, you will naturally uh, overcomplicate. You will naturally veer off course. If you always think about the end user, you will naturally simplify the way that you speak because you are thinking of them first. It's kind of this, na it's just a natural way that it flows. So first and foremost, who is your audience? Second, what is the message that you want to say and how can it best be delivered? Every audience that you're speaking to has a different process or a different preference. Is email best? Is a phone call best? Is a, are you giving a webinar? Are you putting it on a poster? Are you doing a social post? Perhaps you need to think about the different ways that you want to communicate the same message to the same audience, different days, different times. Well, then you need a process and a system. So it's not an easy like, hey, just quickly say what you mean and everything will come out. It does take kind of a, a thought process and a, a system. In our industry, we might call it a communication plan, right? What is your message? Who are you talking to? And then here are all the ways that you're going to communicate that. I do find that when my clients really sit down and focus on the front end on really getting to know who they're talking to, that naturally informs the best way to talk to them, meaning should we call them? Should we have a meeting? Should we have a webinar, social, et cetera, et cetera? And then when you know that you have seven different ways that you're communicating with this one person over the course of seven weeks or eight months or whatever it is, each of those messages naturally can be much more simple because you are the goal of each of those messages can be broken up. And so you end up being able to strategize and think about the way that you're going to craft this big message because you really have now spent the time to understand your audience. So it always goes back to understanding your audience and meeting them where they need, not communicating what you think you should say, but communicating what they want to hear. That's the most important. You know, I, I, I know I've experienced this as well, but the, when I, when I'm talking with, with people in my community or other guests I've had on the podcast, um, and just ADHD in general, that there's this sometimes frustration of like, how do you not understand what I'm saying? Yes. Right. Like what are some questions that you think could be helpful for us as, as people with ADHD that we could ask and sort of own that question uh, or those questions that we can ask to sort of make sure that we are coming off clearly and being understood. Sure. What I like to do is, even though it might sound, sometimes it runs the risk of sounding a bit condescending, but it is never that. And I think it's always better to still ask the question. I say something and I say, does what I said, does it make sense? Do you understand? Are there any follow-up questions? Is there anything that I just said that doesn't seem so clear? And then I pause and that allows the listener to say, I think this, but that. And then I can say, okay, let me explain that again differently. Sometimes even before I start a discussion, let's say it's professionally, right? I'm about to explain something about the pharmaceutical industry. Do you know what I mean when I say pharmaceutical industry? Yes, no. And then, so even as basic as mm. that before I even dive in, now, ironically or not so ironically, this goes back to that same thing, know your audience. So you need to know where your audience stands. You need to know what they know so that you can then craft your message accordingly. And then if you're not sure if you're being clear, then yes, ask that question afterwards. Did that make sense? Sometimes if you don't want to sound condescending, what I'll do is, listen, I know sometimes it's, it's hard to explain or sometimes I struggle to explain this clearly. Did that make sense that I just said, you know, what I just said, did that make sense to you? And so you're putting it on you. You're not putting it on the person that's listening because that's never a great feeling, but you're still, you know, you're giving pause and asking, you know, it's the same thing we, we counsel like providers or doctors and patient physician communication, right? You have a physician who knows a heck of a lot about the, the issue, the patient's coming in, not knowing a lot. Well, the physician needs to explain it and then pause and ask another question, another question give the patient enough time to say, I get that. And I don't get that. Please re-explain. Mm. So I think it's very similar. So one of the things I'm trying to do right now uh, with, with ADHD Rewired is to create, and I've always had a hard time with creating short form content. You know, that yeah. line of, I would have written less if I had more time, right? Yes, is always, always resonated with me because it's like, uh, 100%. It's like, and I enjoy long form content. I enjoyed like longer conversations. 
when I see people who are really good at the short form content who just are, able, are so pithy and it's just short, I'm like, mm-hmm. man, like I, I, I wish I was able to do that. But I'm starting to do some experimentation with creating short like reels and videos because I want to be able to continue to reach more people. Yeah. One of the things that I'm finding is that because I've been in this space and doing this work for so long, there's so many things that I'm finding like, wait, like not everyone knows this. Or it's like, this is not new information to me, so I'm not excited to talk about it, like, because I've done this for, you know, 15 years. What could be a helpful either reframe or something, a framework to kind of think about how I can effectively communicate, you know, different parts about ADHD in that short form uh, format? First of all, what you say very much resonates for me. A lot of time my content is short and I still need to charge because it takes a lot more effort, a lot of expertise. Um, I often think about it as a math problem, actually, that you know who you're talking to, you know what you want to say, and you need to get it into a very small sentence. And so every word that you place in that sentence has to pack meaning. It has to be incredibly purposeful. That takes a lot of focus. That takes a lot of strategy. Long form content tends to be easier because it can be more smooth, right? You're just kind of talking, right? It's a conversation. Sure, you tweak it and edit it, but it's very different. So I I hear what you're saying and it's much more difficult. Um, And I often, I write something down and I take a look again and it takes a lot of edits. It's a math problem. I don't know. I have this word, I have this word, and I need need to find one word that does this. And so that's how I think about it. Um, I think it's breaking down the process, right? So the more that you can categorize and then system, right, and break down and then think of even, uh, like I said before, a communication plan around this. So for example, if you want to talk about setting up your business as an ADHD, you know, entrepreneur, well, that's humongous, right? There is nothing short form about that. So you need to break it down as far as possible. Okay, well, maybe it's like I had an idea, what did I do next? Well, that could probably be broken up into 100 different sections. I, you know, I have an idea you know, my first month in the business, right? Or I decided that I wanted to hire someone and it was the first month hiring someone and what that, that, what that looked like. A day in the life of me as an entrepreneur. Podcast, that's a whole thing. So breaking it up in as many sections as you can, breaking those up into as many sections as you can, and then thinking about how each of those segments is going to be communicated. So you might have an entire series on social or several reels just about a day, you know, Eric, a day running, running the business, right? And that in and of itself is its own little series. And it gives you the opportunity to break everything down in such minutia where, as you said, it might be totally simple for you, but for some of your listeners, they have never gone through it. And that minutia is incredibly valuable to them. So the more detailed you can get and the more the breakdown, it becomes much less overwhelming. And then that short form content is much more palatable. So that's what I would recommend. Hmm. That gives me some stuff to think about there. Yes, yes. Let's, I want to take one more quick break. <laughs> and uh, speaking on the, the realm of entrepreneurship and, and business, I would love for you to share with us after the break kind of what kind of having your own business has taught you about your brain. Sure. So we will be right back. It's that time again for a farce product that doesn't really exist. Introducing the ADHD Rewired Time Traveling To-Do List. Hey there, focus fanatics and procrastination pros. Are you tired of forgetting tasks until it's too late? Do you wish you could just rewind time and get that stuff done? Well, guess what? Now you can, sort of. What is it? The ADHD Rewired Time Traveling To-Do List, TM, is a revolutionary, not yet patented, not yet patented, patent, I can't say that word. Not yet patented. <laughs> Not yet patented. Oh my god. Not yet patented. Not yet patented. No, it's not a pant. Not yet patented. It's a revolutionary, not yet patented. Absolutely imaginary product that lets you write down tasks you should have done yesterday and then not do them again today. It's like a regular to-do list, but with a twist of lime and a dash of regrets. Features, retroactive reminders. Get notified about tasks you forgot before you even forgot them. It's like your future self is nagging you, but in a friendly way. Procrastination points. Earn points for every task you don't do. Redeem them for more time to not do other tasks. It's a cycle of inactivity you simply can't resist. Also featuring time loop technology. 
every time you check something off, it reappears for tomorrow. Because why do today what you could put off until the day after tomorrow, right? And don't forget squirrel mode. A pop-up squirrel distracts you every 15 minutes so you feel right at home. For just three easy payments of $19.99, this non-existent product can be yours today. But wait, there's more. Order now and we will include a free set of focus goggles. They're just like regular goggles with the word focus written on them. Call now. Operators are standing by to ignore your call. Because remember, this isn't real. But you know what is real? The support that you can get from everything here at ADHD Rewired. From our online virtual co-working community, Adult Study Hall, you could sign up for at adultstudyhall.com. It's only $19.99 a month, and we have a 24-7 dropping room and all kinds of facilitated sessions, and it's free to try for the first week. We also have a free Facebook community that you could apply at my website at adhdrewired.com slash community. And if you want to support our work and get ad-free episodes, the ads are actually at the very end of the episode. You can become a patron starting at $5 a month month at patreon.com slash ADHD rewired. And don't forget, you can join us on the fourth Tuesday of every month for a group coaching call for just $25 a month or more. You can sign up at ADHD rewired.com slash Patreon. And of course, you can learn about our coaching groups at the website, coachingrewired.com. And you can also sign up for our live Q&A that we do every second Tuesday of the month at 10.30 a.m. Pacific, 1.30 p.m. Eastern. Sign up for that at ADHD rewired.com. And just click on the events tab at the top of the page. You can find it all at ADHDrewired.com. That's ADHDrewired.com. Now, back to the show. All right, we are back. All right, so Jessica, what have you learned about your own brain through having your own business? Wow. Um... I would say the first thing and most important because it's impacted me in a variety of different areas is just working on my self-esteem. Uh, you cannot grow a business without getting rejected. You cannot grow a business without putting yourself out there and recognizing that you're not perfect and you never will be perfect. And you know, you're not launching a business because you're perfect. You're launching a business because the thing that you're selling, you have exceptional expertise in. So having that conversation with myself daily, and being bold enough to share my website or post something and know that some people will like it and some people won't has been difficult and incredibly liberating, I have to say. So that's been a very purposeful journey that I've had to go on. And that's impacted my, my personal relationships too. I feel like my, you know, I have my feelings hurt less. I just think I've, I've become a little bit uh, stronger, which is wonderful. I would say also, uh, I used the word bold before, but I wanted to be a bold entrepreneur. In order to be successful, you really have to take risks and put yourself out there in a way that when you're working for a company, you just don't have to. And so anytime I've been afraid of something, I have told myself I need to do it because typically mm. growth is on the other side of fear. That has really helped me become bold. And I'm Do you have any specific stories it. that you can share about uh, being bold yeah. recently? Yeah. And, and and it's not even that it's um it's like taken off yet, but I started like, okay, I'll, you know, I'll do some videos on YouTube or on and and like filming myself is like ugh, so awkward, you know? And I was like, what why would anyone want to watch me? And then I realized like it's not it's not about that. It's just about getting my name out there and trying to connect with people. And however it happens, great. And if one person watches my video, great. But that was terrifying because I sort of told myself a story like why why would you know what do I know, right? Why, what do I think that I know enough? Um, but the truth is, I have a lot of experience in what I'm selling. And that's what I'm selling, right? I'm not trying to sell anything I don't think I'm actually pretty good at. So let me just do it. But that was a total example of like, oh my God, I'm terrified and I'm just going to do it anyway. Even my first post on LinkedIn, it feels like nothing now, but posting on LinkedIn as me, Jessica Ovadia, and not someone else working for someone else, you know, that was terrifying. But I did it and it was totally okay. That, that's been a great lesson, certainly. And then I just think I really enjoy, I always enjoy meeting and talking to potential clients. And I have leaned in to appreciating those initial calls because not every call turns into business and that's totally okay. I really enjoy growing my network. I really enjoy the space I'm in. I find healthcare to be fascinating. 
I love putting myself in positions where I'm asking great questions and getting to learn, you know, about new people. The fulfilling relationships piece has been something really exciting that I've learned as an entrepreneur. And it gives me that motivation that, as we were talking about before, can uh, dry up. So you need you need to figure out how to get it from different places. And meeting new people has certainly been that for me. Mm. So as you know, here we are, two people with ADHD. Yeah. You're a, a health communicator. If you were uh, hired to be on the ADHD of Education Council, which is not actually a thing, uh, but we're just yeah. going to pretend that it is for a moment. Yeah. And, should be, should be. <laughs> right? And how to get better public understanding and messaging about what ADHD really is. Because it still is, like, as far as, like, psychiatric diagnoses, there is more research about ADHD than probably any other disorder out there. And yet, there's probably more misinformation about ADHD than any other disorder out there. What would the yeah. messaging campaign be to help people really understand what ADHD really is? I think it would be about real people and the real challenges. I think um, historically it's been about like children who can't sit still, which first of all does a disservice for the actual children who have actual challenges because at least when I was growing up, there was, oh, please, every doctor give every kid, a, you know, everyone has ADHD, everyone gets medicine. And it really cheapened the experience for the people who are actually struggling. But then we also have adults, right? And now, yes, we see all over the internet, oh, I have ADHD, I'm an adult, I'm an adult. But to have this education platform that we're <laughs> developing, the ADHD educate, right? Have real people with real challenges and have them be varied. Because I think the challenge, right, with communicating about ADHD is that it is not a one size fits all. Everyone looks different inside. Everyone's struggles are very different. It is very, very challenging to describe what it is and that creates a lot of isolation and loneliness. And that's where a lot of the feelings of the self-esteem issues and people feeling less than because they can't communicate what their challenge is and it's not understood by anyone. So I think really showcasing real people with real challenges. I'm a communicator and I love words. So I like to sort of describe, like sometimes I'll say to my husband, okay, I just feel like my brain's on fire right now. Mm. There are these times that I try to sort of capture how I'm feeling with phrases. Now, that might not mean anything to him, but I think that, some, you know, sometimes these phrases can at least say to him like, okay, that's, I, wow, you know, there's something going on there, right? Or um, I recently explained to someone why uh, I'm not great with directions and I Sure, I could become great with directions, but the amount of brain space that I would have to take from other things to focus on that, and I wouldn't be good at it. I know I wouldn't be good at it. So I would have to take a lot of energy to focus on something that I won't be good at when I'm going to focus on other things that I can succeed in because it's not worth it. But even describing that, my friend said, wow. I've never, I didn't know that that's a thing with ADHD, right? Um, so real people with real struggles, really articulating what's going on in here, um, I think would be so valuable to the community and I don't know, to everyone at large. Um, it would help us all, I think. I'm curious uh, personally what your thoughts are on sort of the positive, I sometimes look at is a little bit of toxic positivity piece of ADHD. Like the ADHD is a superpower. Yeah. What are your thoughts about that? I think, I think for a lot of people, it probably makes it feel um, belittling, right? Because you wouldn't say that about really any other disability. You wouldn't say it's a superpower, um, at least not what I hear, right? However, I do think there's a lot of value in saying, this is who you are. This is what makes things hard for you. And this is what makes you special. And how even starting from a young kid, right? How can we help people, children, adults master their life, leaning into both their challenges and their gifts, right? I, I don't know if I can say, well, I am creative because of my ADHD. I, I don't know if I can say that. Yeah. All I know, right? I feel I feel my struggles. Those are my struggles. What I can say is when I'm on the right medication dose, I feel like the real version of myself. I can mm. say that with full, I feel at peace. I feel more creative. It doesn't stunt me. I feel like myself. Would I feel that way with or without ADHD? I, I can't tell you. And I'm not sure that anyone who says yeah. I am who I am because of it, I don't know. Right. But 
I also am a very strong believer that we can't blame the things that we have, right, for, for our life. We have to take responsibility and access the resources that we have and try and make it a little bit easier, knowing that some things, yes, are more difficult than others. Um, and that's our life. And so we have a choice to make, you know, not to sound insensitive, like I think. No, uh, but I, I, I think that's a really, to me, a, a healthy kind of growth minded perspective to say, OK, so I have. ADHD or whatever it is and say, this is hard. What can I do about that? Versus right. this is hard because I have ADHD, period. Right. <laughs> what, what, what good is that? Right. Like how, where, exactly. do we, where do we go from there? Exactly. Um, I can, I think I'm pretty gritty <laughs> and I think I contribute my grit to the fact that not, you know, school didn't come easy. Like just basic things that came easily to other people weren't easy for me. Mm. Um, and so, Yes, you know, I could say, so that's my superpower, or maybe I could say I've I've had to work harder, which in some cases totally sucked, you know, honestly, but it's made me someone who's not afraid of hard work, who's not afraid of a challenge, who's excited about an opportunity for growth, who has that mindset, you know, that's growth mindset. So I think there's a billion ways to look at the same issue and it's, it all comes down to, so how do we want to live our life with it? And I've chosen this approach, but I don't judge anyone else who has a different approach, obviously, because it is a lot of struggle. There's definitely a lot of excitement and beauty that can be had. I'm just not sure that ADHD is beauty on its own, I guess is, is my takeaway. <laughs> I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I mean, and, and listeners might have, you know, some different thoughts about that, which is yes. which is fine, which is why, you know, which is what community is, right? It's like we have, have this exchange of ideas. You know, I'm sharing what's true for me. You're sharing what's true for you. Uh, all of our past guests have done, done the same and try to have a come together and have this sort of collective conversation to have a deeper understanding of this lived experience, which is living with ADHD as an adult. Absolutely. Um, and I think ultimately we are who we are. And I don't know if I can point to it's because of this or because of that. I don't know. But yeah, I mean, I've had a lot of struggles and I've had a lot of blessings. And for whatever reason they are, that this is who I am. So I guess that's it. <laughs> All right. Your, uh, your website is at Jessica Ovadia. So it's O-V-A-D-I-A dot com. Any final thoughts that you want to leave listeners with? Um, no, I mean, I think the community you've built is is really incredible. Um, and it is it is always wonderful to connect with others who have similar struggles. We all have very different approaches to how we want to handle it or how we can. But it's so it's so critical to not feel lonely through this because there's a lot of us. There's a lot of us struggling with these things and we're all trying to live the most productive, healthy life we can. So it's great to connect. It's great to be here and uh, I appreciate it. Well, thank you. And we will put the uh, link to your website on the show notes. And uh, for our patrons, um, we're gonna, I'm going to ask two more questions uh, as we come to the outro here, but we will include those questions for our patrons. So if you're curious about what those questions are, become a patron. Thank you so much, Jessica. No problem. Thank you. This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find timestamped summaries and additional resources for each episode. Apply to join our free and secret Facebook community. Learn more about our award-winning intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. Join the Adult Study Hall virtual co-working membership community. Find all the other podcasts on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. Sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content that you won't hear anywhere else. And use the search tool to find episodes on specific topics. You can do all of this at ADHDrewired.com. While you're there, click on the Patreon button. If you are a regular listener, consider making a monthly contribution by becoming a patron. If you are able to financially support my work, it would mean a lot. This show is free to you, the listener, but it's not free to produce. Plus, patrons get cool perks like ad-free episodes and access to recordings of coaching calls and $25 a month patrons can join me once a month for a group coaching call. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tibbers. You can like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ADHD Rewired. If you're a coach, therapist, or related professional, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash Eric Tibbers. Subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube to see selective interviews and other videos I've made. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. 
Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends, family, your therapists, your coaches, doctors, siblings, parents. And if you, your coach, therapist, doctor, or ADHD support group leader would like a pack of podcast postcards to hand out, you can request those at the website, ADHDrewired.com. If you are a member of Chad, Ada, or any other ADHD support group, please be sure to tell them about this show and all the shows on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. And if you really loved this particular episode, please hit share on your podcast player. I'm only one person, and I do count on you to help spread this message. One of the biggest things that you can do to support this podcast and help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts or any other app that supports reviews. And don't forget to hit subscribe so new episodes are automatically pushed to your favorite podcast app. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at Audible by going to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Here is my list of must-listen-to audiobooks updated July 2021. Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg, attached by Amir Levin and Rachel Heller. Atomic Habits by James Clear. The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni. Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson. The Coaching Habit by Michael Stainer. The Body Keeps Score by Bessel van der Kolk. Rest by Alex Sujong Kim Pang. The Five Second Rule by Mel Robbins. Make It Stick. The Science of Successful Learning by Peter Brown. The Productivity Project by Chris Bailey. Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics by Dan Harris. Change Your Questions, Change Your Life by Marilee G. Adams. I always recommend to my coaches and admin that they read that book. The One Thing by Gary Keller, a required reading for all of our coaching group members. Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Baden. The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. And if you're looking for something a little bit more magical, I have fallen in love with the Harry Potter series and the narrator, Jim Dale, is amazing. And of course, if you haven't yet boarded the Brene Brown bus, all of her stuff is great. Starting with Gifts of Imperfection, Daring Greatly, Rising Strong, and The Power of Vulnerability. And if you're an entrepreneur or leader, be sure to check out her book, Dare to Lead. Do you have something that you would like to share? Click on the podcast tab at ADHD Rewired. Click the button to be a guest at the top of the page and schedule a 15-minute interview. This is Eric Tibbers, reminding you to keep learning, growing, and connecting. Self-care is not selfish. No matter what you get done or don't get done, you are still enough. And no matter how hard it feels, we can do hard things. And we don't need to do them in the hardest way possible. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.